Hey, welcome. I'm Pastor John Boyacek, and this is Fairview Baptist Church. We're so glad that you could join us for a slice of what Fairview life is all about. We want you to be here and be part of what God is doing in this community. Well, I was at my mother-in-law's this weekend, and I'm usually quite amazed when I'm there. She always has some type of new gadget to show me. It just seems like this. She didn't show me this, but I heard she bought it. And every 84-year-old needs this. It's a slider press, right? You want to make little hamburgers for everybody who comes on over. She, she felt she needed to get one of these things. And why? I don't even have one. But... Uh, think about going to see my mother-in-law. She's not a hoarder. Okay, she's not. Okay, she's not. But she loves new gadgets. And, and she has things like um, um, new pot holders and, and different things that go over your teacups. And all the, she, she's on the cutting edge of new gadgetry, and she's fun to be with. Um, she likes things new. Um, it seems like she redecorates every two years. Like the paint on the walls, uh, get new color and other things like that. I don't paint my house that much, but she does. And um, she's pretty cool. Now, I, I'm not quick with the latest gadgets, and I tend to wait until things wear out in my life. I, I do appreciate good craftsmanship, though, and, and I'm amazed at times at what the older craftsmen used to do, build watches and things like that, or, or carve and and, um, and make special ornate things by hand. We, we've lost that as we make things mass production in our new modern age. But you know what? So much of the new is better. I, I don't think any of us want the same phone technology that we had back in the 1970s and the same phone plan that worked back then. Now, um, I don't... I don't miss going to the phone booth to call home. I, I like to have a cell phone. I, I like that new technology. Um, I, I, I'm glad, I, I don't miss the old cameras. You remember the old cameras? Hold still, okay, and, 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 and then you have to go get it developed, and when you look at your film, you realize that you, you, you jiggled the camera too much and everything's just blurry or everybody's eyes are shut, and, it, and you have to wait like, what? weeks before you get your film back. I, I don't miss that. Um, I don't miss dial-up internet. I, I don't miss smog that old cars used to produce. And in fact, I, I don't miss the old style of medicine that I've heard from in the past, but even when I was younger, it, it was there. It was where, where people died from preventable diseases or from a simple surgery that they do today. Or, or where, where in the olden days, when infant mortality was so high that you wondered if the baby and the mother would make it. And you're always nervous when somebody got pregnant. So many of the new ways are better. Much better that none of us really want to go back to many of the old ways. But at times we long for yesterday. The good old days when they were easier, when they were nicer, when they were simpler. At least that's how we see them. Many of us were younger those days, and we really didn't have much of a care in the world, so we didn't really have many worries in the world, and everything was carefree and fun. We were really blinded to the bad things of life. The old way. The new way. We've been doing a series in the book of Ephesians called Hope, Riches, and, and Power. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church that's in Ephesus. It's a, it's a church that's struggling really to, to move forward in, in a very difficult place. And we looked at the first chapter of chapter 1 where, where he gives great truths of what Christ has done and who Christ is and, and, and what Christ is doing in their lives. And today we pick up on chapter 2 where he looks back to their old ways of living. It reminds them that there's so much of a better way to live. I think all of us, if we're truly honest, 
we wonder at times is, if this Christian life's really worth it. Is this Christian life really worth it? We, we look at many people around the world who are, who are carefree and enjoying life and living the dream. And we can also look at our past and say, it, it was easier back then. It was easier back then when everything was carefree. And we need a reality check sometimes. When we start thinking about giving up, when we start thinking about taking another path other than following after Christ. And those are two pulls we live with. We, we have a pull from the past that kind of wants us to take us back to the old way, and, and we have a, a pull to something else. And so this morning, I'm going to talk about the two pulls we live with. The two pulls we live with, and it's in, found in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 7. Follow along as I, as I read this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And, and God raised us up with Christ and, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparably riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This is God's word. May he be forever praised. Let's, 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 let's pray, shall we? Lord, as we look into this now, as we reflect on your word, may we get a better glimpse of you. May we see what you want us to see, not just see it, but also put into practice today, Lord. So God, our thoughts, God, our time together, transform us by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So he talks about the pool to the past. You and I are quick to believe lives. Just look at those people. Look at those people. Not even a care in the world. It, they're, they're the perfect family, right? It's the perfect picture. And, and then, now take a look at these people and the fun that they're having, you know, on Facebook, on Instagram, right? Take a look what they're doing right now. Maybe I'd rather be there than here. Maybe I'd rather be there than teaching Sunday school right now. Um, and and, and we, we think about those things. We're, we're not like them. We're not like those pictures. And, and they seem like they don't have a care in the world. And you know, some people don't have a care in the world. I met those people who do not have a care in the world. Have you met those people? They have, also have no sense of responsibility. If there's a problem, it's not their fault. My spouse is the problem, or the teacher is the problem, or my boss is the problem, or the police, you know, they're the problem. Not me, I have no problems. We meet those people. Not a care in the world. But they don't have a relation, healthy relationship with anybody else either. You know, we play those games. The other side looks so much better. The old way seems so much good. <laughs> What am I doing on this Christian walk? And Paul says, remember where you came from. Remember where you came from. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us used to live among them, at one time gratifying the cravings of our flesh and, and following its desires and thoughts. 
saying, hey, church at Ephesus, remember where you came from. The majority of you were, came with baggage. You, you had messy backgrounds. Some of you people of Ephesus, some of you were really religious and thought that goodness came from the things that you did, the rules that you kept, and and, and the prayers that you said, and, and the way that you looked in the community, and you said, if I do more good, if I do these things, God's going to look on me with much more favor, and, and, and I'm a great religious person. Some of you were like that. Some of the people were from a broken background where, where they had unhealthy relationships with many lovers. They, they didn't know what true relationships were all about. Taking advantage of other people was their lifestyle. Then there were others who were chasing after money and, 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 and impressing others as, as money being their God. Others with a lifestyle of drinking and partying. In fact, church at Ephesus, if you compare it to our world around us, not much has changed even today. Our society hasn't changed much at all. Paul says, remember, remember your formal ways, the ways that used to be. And, and the way he paints this picture, he says, don't gloss over it. It's, it was ugly. It wasn't nice at all. So often we gloss over our past at times. It's interesting, when the Berlin Wall fell and freedom came to the former Soviet Union, USSR, the older people of the USSR, former USSR, struggled with their new freedom. They wanted the old way. You know, well, at least we had bread on our table and it was free. Yeah, but you had long lines to get that bread. At least I had a paycheck. Yeah, but I couldn't pay for anything. And if you spoke your mind back then, you would have been sent to the gulag to die, where millions of others were killed innocent people. If you had a surplus of a product, the government would come and take it. You were always suspicious of your neighbor, thinking that they might report you to the authorities, and you were always living among the crazy whims of those of the state who would get you into trouble. You really wanted to go back to the old way? You really wanted to go back to the old Russia? Seriously? And the old way for believers... He says, you were dead in your sins. And some of us, thankfully, really don't remember our old way. Some of us had parents who, who were believers, and they introduced us to Christ at a very young age, and, and we really weren't dead in our sins for very long. But the fact is, each and every one of us were once there. We were once there. And it says this, it says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now working in, in those who are disobedient. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Satan. And he's talking about Satan and his demons. You used to follow after Satan and his demons. You used to follow the ruler of this, the, the air, the ruler of this world, the ruler of this age, Satan. No, I didn't. Yeah. You're not following God, you're following after the things of Satan. It's one or the other. He says, y you were. Don't sugarcoat it. And, and he goes on. He, he says, he says um, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and, and following its desires and thoughts. He mentions three things that we get prone to fall back into. Three things that really keep us from God. And, and the three things are this, the world. The world, the, the lure of the world keeps us from God. It says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And, 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 And we can easily get sidetracked by the ways of this world, the parties of this world, the money of this world, a job, friendships of this world, good things that can steal our heart away from the things of God. The good things that God have, has given to us, but, but sometimes they twist it and drag us away from the things of God. 
And, and, and then we're talked about Satan and his demons. In fact, some of you today were distracted by Satan and his demons. No, it wasn't yet. Yeah, you were. Maybe just before you came to church, you and your wife had a little fight over something that was so stupid. And you're thinking, why did I ever fight over that silly thing this morning? Well, probably because Satan put it there just for you guys to argue. Or you and your child. Or maybe your boss called you this morning and said, this wasn't done. And it's distracted you and saying, should I go to church or should I not go to church? Should I do this? And, and he's just subtle. He, he distracts. He said, no, no, you don't need to go here today. Satan and his demons, they're, they're at work. And the third thing is our, our sinful desires, the, 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 the lure of our own desires, um, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and, and, and thoughts. We can get addicted and sidetracked to things that draw us into a pit, like alcohol or drugs or going after pornography or wasting money on gambling or giving into a desire that God does not want us to give into. We, we can go after sex outside of marriage. When, when, when God says um, we're supposed to be just attracted to our spouse, we can get attracted to other things. Lying can be natural. Stealing can be natural. Taking illegal drugs can seem to be natural, but the the Bible says, no, those things, those things don't go there. Don't go there. They, they'll trap us. The lure of our own desires. Paul says that's what many of you were like. Living carefree, going after worldliness because of the devil's schemes, and going after our own desires. And because of those things, be, be, because of us going out of the boundaries that God said, this is the way to play the game of life, and God being the divine referee said, hey, you've gone out of the boundaries. You deserve to be out of the game. That divine referee should have ejected us out of the game. And then in verse 4, this three-letter word comes up. But... But, it says, like the rest of us, we were deserving the nature, uh, deserving, uh, uh, by nature, deserving of wrath. But, we were deserving wrath. We were deserving the wrath of God. The holy, righteous God could not look at sin, so he says, it's time to eject you out of the game. Sin deserves punishment. The wrath of God deals with sin. I, I like what A.W. Tozer says. He says, God and holiness is the moral condition necessary to the health of the universe. God is holy and holiness is the moral condition necessarily for the health of this universe. Whatever is holy is healthy. Think about that. The holiness of God, the wrath of God, and the health of creation is inseparably united. You need to have the holiness of God and you need to have the wrath of God. God's wrath is his utter intolerance for whatever degrades and destroys. He hates iniquity as a mother hated the cancer that would take the life of the child. We want to see wrath come down on 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 disease and sickness. And we struggle with that word wrath in our modern age. Fleming Rutledge, his new book, The Crucifixion, Understanding the Death of Jesus Christ, and she acknowledges the difficulty that modern people have with the concept of God's wrath. And she says this, a slogan in our times is, where is the outrage? And it has been applied to everything from big pharma market, market manipulation to CEOs' astronomical wealth to police officers' stonewalling. Where is the outrage, inquire many commentators, wondering why congressmen, uh, uh, officials, and ordinary voters seem to be so indifferent. 
Why has the gap between the rich and the poor become so huge? Why are so many mentally ill people slipping through the cracks? Why does gun violence continue to be the hallmark of American culture? Why are there so many innocent people on death row? Why are the prisons filled with such preponderance of blacks and Hispanic men? This is American. Where is the outrage? And the public outrage is all over cyberspace about all kinds of things that annoy us personally. The not in my backyard syndrome. It's, it's the outrages. The outrages in the heart of God go unnoticed and go unaddressed. And we're resistant to the wrath of God. We might pause next time and, and reflect next time when we're outraged about something about our property values being threatened, or our children's educational opportunities being limited, or our tax breaks being eliminated. All of us are capable of anger about something. But God's anger, however, is pure. It does not have the maintenance of privilege as its object, but goes on behalf, on, on behalf of those who have no privileges. The wrath of God is not an emotion that flares up from time to time. And though God had temper tantrums, as though God has had temper tantrums, it's a way of describing his absolute enmity against all wrong and his come to set matters right. He says, we deserve the wrath of God. We deserve the wrath of God because of one little sin. And all of us could say, no, we've done more than one little sin. We violated God's holiness. In a way, we deserve to be obliterated. But, but, God, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It, has, it is by grace you have been saved. I'm thankful that the, the story doesn't end there. His great love for us. His great love for us. Um, his great love for us. And His great grace. Even when we are dead in our transgressions. Think about that. A, a dead person can't do anything for themselves. You know, d defibrillators are really good for restarting a person's heart. And if your heart stops and you have a defibrillator nearby, that's great. But the problem is you can't use that defibrillator on yourself. Someone else has to do it. You're useless on your own. You cannot use that defibrillator when you're dead. Someone else has to use it. The Bible says we were dead in our transgressions. There was nothing we can do, but God's grace came. God's grace came and said, no, I'm going to take you out of that mess. I'm going to give you life. I'm going to forgive you. When we were dead in our transgression, God made us alive in Christ. And on the Christ, cross, Christ did that. And we can't do it ourselves. And he paid the price for our sins when he went to the cross and his blood was shed for us. He paid for the penalty for our sins. He took the wrath of God. And he allows forgiveness and cleansing when we couldn't do it on our own. Have you accepted his cleansing and forgiveness in your life? Have you allowed his grace to overwhelm you and free you from that sin and transform you into the person that he wants you to be? Are you his child? Can you say, there was a time when in my life where I, I, I repented, I turned from my old ways. I decided to follow Jesus and I received that great gift of salvation. His grace, his mercy. There's this pull to go back. But there's God in his great grace. But there's also a great power and a great plan. And, and the story goes on and it says this. He made us alive with Christ 
even when we were dead in our transgressions. And it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and, and seated him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that the coming ages he might show the incomparably riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Last week we, we talked about how he, Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Seated means it's finished. No more work needs to be done. He can rest. His feet are up almost. It, he, it's done. There's no other power above him. It's done. It's complete. And when we come to Christ, he, he seated us with him, beside him. There's no more work that we need to do to get rid of our sin. Now, while we're here on earth, we struggle with these things. We struggle with our past. But Christ says, no, it's done. It's finished. Come on up here. Look at me. I, I, I got great power for you. I, I got a great plan for you. Come, look at me. So often we want to go backwards. No, the world, it looks so good. No, I got these desires. I, I they go against God's word, but I got these desires. Satan's going, ha <laughs> ha. And we get sucked back. We get pulled back into the old way. And Christ says, no, no, my power is greater. My plan's greater for you. And some of us don't believe that. Some of us don't look at that. Some of us would rather look at the garbage of the past instead of look to God's power and plan for our lives. It's so much greater. You believe it? We need to turn to it. I, I, I realize the world sucks us back. Satan wants to make you ineffective. And sinfulness can paralyze us. And Christ's power is greater. It is. We need to turn to him. I must admit this weekend I've been overwhelmed by funerals. Our former intern... Tim Greaves, his, his father died, and the funeral was yesterday. Yesterday afternoon, Sally McTavish, uh, had her son's funeral was, was then, and I unfortunately could not attend either one of those services. I already committed to attend another service of a good friend of mine, a childhood friend of mine down uh, near Sarnia, and so I had to be there. And uh, I, his name was Steve, and Steve and I went to the same high school together. In fact, we were part of the same youth group, same church. And uh, he was a talented guy, a couple years older than me, talented guy. He, 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 just a great voice, he could sing anything. And um, Steve, Steve also had a hilarious personality, just made everybody laugh. He was just that type of guy. And so Steve and I, he, we, he lived down the road from me, and we'd go to church together. He'd pick me up, and we'd go to church, youth group, other things together. And we did a few things together growing up, but he was a couple years older than me. Uh, he ended up marrying a girl in youth group, Heather. I ended up marrying Sandy from another church. And I went off, and I ended up going into ministry and uh, being a pastor up in Exeter. He ended up getting into um, the, the landscaping business and became a landscaper and owned his own business. And our, our ways departed, and, and uh, I went my way, he went his other way. But whenever we saw each other, we'd say hi type thing. Fast forward to 2005. I'm at West Park in London. I'm the associate pastor there. And we were looking for a children's ministry director. Steve still attended West Park. He was heavily involved there, both he and his wife. And uh, he was on the leadership team in terms of, uh, uh, he was an elder there. He also uh, served and taught. And he was just that type of guy, just willing to give in, a, a pitch in, do whatever it takes. He had a ministry heart. And so we were looking for this children's ministry director. And Steve was a little bit zany himself. And, we, and the, the leadership team of the church came and tapped on the shoulder and said, Steve, would you consider going to ministry? And would you consider taking on this ministry position at the church? He had three young kids, um, roughly the same age as my kids. And uh, he said, uh, 
well, let me think about it. Let me pray about it. And he just really sensed the call of God in his life. So he said, yeah, I'll quit my job. I will uh, start seminary, and I will head in this position. I'll do this position. And God called him into ministry. And uh, uh, we became, we were good friends as, as I helped orient aid him to the ministry and how to do things. And, and we just saw him grow and take off in the Lord. And he, he spent about six years doing that ministry at West Park. And then God called him to another, uh, to be a lead pastor at a church in Wyoming, Ontario. And he was there for six years. About a year ago, Sandy and I saw him at Heritage graduation. We saw he and his wife, Heather, and we had a great time catching up. It was a good time. We were just those type of friends. John Howe's ministry, Steve Howe's ministry, it was, it was good. Then a little bit after that, he was diagnosed with esophagus cancer. And, um, and the Lord seemed fit to take him home on February the 14th. And Friday was his funeral. And I was there, and it was many testimonies of God's goodness and how God used Steve. And his kids, same age as my kids, roughly, they got up and gave a big tribute to their dad, how dad showed Jesus to them, how dad taught, taught the word of God to them. And other people talked about how great of a pastor he was. And I know Steve wouldn't want to hear any of that stuff, but... He was. God used him in some great ways and transformed many people's lives through the power of God through Steve's life. It, it was great. I cried. It was so sad. Especially when these kids are the same age as my kids. That's not the full story, though. I left one part out. There was a major black spot in his life. A couple years after he got married and got into this um, landscaping business, he did the most Im unimaginable thing. His business was struggling, and it turned out he, he bid on some jobs that really cost more than he uh, really thought, and, and he was struggling financially, and he was a little bit proud, and he just didn't feel like asking people for help, and his, his company was going over under, he couldn't pay the bills, so he got desperate, and he decided to go rob a bank. And he'd drive into a, a small town just outside of London, and he'd pass the, the teller a, a note saying, I have a weapon, give me all your money. And he'd walk out of the bank, wouldn't catch him. Hit the front, news, uh, front page of the newspaper for, for months, and this guy would go in and, and, and he'd rob banks and he'd come out and nobody would catch him. By God's providence, he was caught. And the true team took down this dangerous armed criminal. My friend Steve. They arrested him. And he was guilty. And he realized he was guilty. He also realized he deserved all the punishment that he had coming to him. And so the first thing he did, he pled guilty. He also went to his wife and apologized and repented to her. I should say he repented to God first. He pled guilty. He also talked to his wife. They also went to the leadership of his church. He said, I've sinned terribly. I'm sorry. I sinned against God. I sinned against my family. I sinned against this country. And I remember when that came out. I wasn't going to the ch that, his church. I was at another ministry. I remember that coming out. My mom was a, a teller at the Bank of Montreal. She, she, was, she wasn't robbed by him. But I thought, man, just take that key, throw him in the jail, and throw that key away. Oh, I can't believe he did that. Such a let everybody down, Steve. I, I remember my heart saying that. But he repented. He went to the church leadership, and the church leader said, said, we forgive you. Why? Because God's grace demands us to forgive you. 
Steve was sentenced to prison for seven years. And he went there. Thankfully, he got out a little bit earlier than that. And he, his life was transformed there again. And he came back to church. A number of people in the church said, I don't want to be a church who does this. And there are a number of people who left the church when the church said, no, we're going to restore our brother. We're, we're going to work with him. And so he, when he got out of prison, he got a new job. He, he paid his debts back. In fact, he went back, and uh, during that time, he also re- apologized to all the tellers he, he traumatized, too. He repented. He repented. And he turned to Christ. Got a job. Got involved in the church. And we just saw him working and saying, I want to serve God with my life. I want to serve God with my life. He was a good husband. And he was a good father. And became a good pastor. And God used him in some great ways. And he died well. That's the power of God's grace. You see, Steve could have said, yeah, my life is over. I did a horrible, rotten thing. And I, I am a bank robber and everybody's going to see me as one. It, was, it wasn't even mentioned at his funeral. What was mentioned was God's grace in his life and how God used them. And God used him to transform people because he didn't say, I'm going to live in that old way, that old way is pulling me back and and I'm defeated. He said, no, I'm I'm going to look to Christ. I'm going to look to Christ and his plan and I'm going to look to Christ for his power and I'm going to let Christ transform me. Some of you this morning are saying, I don't know if it's worth it. Just keep on being sucked back. I'm struggling with this sin. I'm struggling with this habit that keeps... Drag me back. Christ's plan and Christ's power is so much more sufficient than your past. And you need to cling to that. You need to turn to that. You need some brothers and sisters around you to help you through these things so that you could see his work continue in your life. So often people define themselves with... With so many different things. I, I'm, I'm a prisoner. I'm a loser. God sees me as a sinner. I'm a drunk. I'm a drug addict. I'm a, I'm a gambler. I'm a divorcee. I'm a pervert. Christ's grace says, no, you can be much more than that. You're a child of God. And I have a purpose. And I have a plan. And I'm going to give you power to get through this. God's grace, his mercy, his love, his power is greater than any sin, than any black spot. And it says with God's grace, he shows us how to live. And it says, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Do you believe that? Do you cling to that? Mercy Me is a band I listen to, a Christian band that I listen to. They have a song that says this. It says, no matter what you've done, grace comes like a flood. There's hope to carry on to finish what he started. My prayer is that Christ has started some work in your life and and there's hope to carry on. Grace comes in like a flood. Continue on. New things. My mother-in-law likes new things. She does. But Christ's plan and power, they're not cheap gadgets. Okay, they're not. They're powerful things that continue to transform I just want to say, don't go back. Don't go back. Christ's plan and power is so much greater than your past. Let me pray. Lord God, thank you for this reminder of what you have done. And Lord, at times we feel defeated because Satan whispers in our ears and says, you're not good enough. At times we feel defeated because the world just closes in around us. And we, 
we get sucked into it. At times we feel defeated because we just have this terrible habit, sinful habit that keeps dragging us down. Lord Jesus, thank you for your power. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy and your love that transforms us. May we cling to that. May we look to that. May we get others around us that spur us on towards love and good deeds and, and encourages us on towards your power and your plan. And Lord, I pray for those people who might be struggling right now. That they would, first of all, seek you and your forgiveness. But Lord, they'd also seek others. Thank you for new beginnings and new things. Thank you for the plan that you already have, that you're already on the other side, too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, you know what? We are a community that loves Jesus, and we want you to be part of this. Feel free to give us a call or even drop us an email. We'd love to hear from you.